And welcome to Nats Chat for Monday, May 13th, 2024. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. Mark Zuckerman is off for this installment of the podcast, but I'm pleased to be joined by the man who runs the podcast, Tim Shovers. And unfortunately, the Nats on Sunday afternoon ran themselves into way too many outs, uh, a 3-2 loss at the Boston Red Sox to lose the series two games to one. The Nats for this regular season are back to being below 500. The record now 19 and 20. This installment of the Nats Chat podcast is brought to us by Roaming Rooster. Roaming Rooster is at Nationals Park. is proudly stationed in Section 386 in left center field, adding flavor to every game day experience. That's Roaming Rooster in Section 386 at Nationals Park. Uh, Tim, the Nats on Sunday afternoon got a good outing from starting pitcher Mackenzie Gore, got more good work from the bullpen, got yet another home run from the uh, piping hot Eddie Rosario, but four significant outs on the base pass combined with two errors, including a brutal error by Victor Robles, who had a brutal game. Uh, All of these things, big problems, and the Nats uh, do end up losing the game. For a game in which the Nets never were ahead, this is one of the more frustrating losses of the season. You talk about the amount of outs that they gave away on the bases, including rather poetically the final out of the game. Mackenzie Gore pitched really well, you know, career high in pitches, uh, but one bad inning by the team, and that's all Boston needed. And it's frustrating because the Nets probably should have taken this series and they started out winning the opener on Friday night and then they lose both games on the weekend. And as the road trip continues, as they move out to Chicago, they're kind of back where they were, which is back under 500. Now it's just one game under 500, but there is a chance for some momentum. And today was a, was a step in the opposite direction. It's funny. The Nats are in every game. (laughs) Like every game is close and When the Nats win, they win close. When they lose, they lose close. Every game is coming down to the final few innings. And uh, this game, obviously no exception with it being a uh, one-run decision. But here is something that speaks to how well the Nats have been doing. They now have a losing streak for the first time in two and a half weeks. The Nats now have lost at least two consecutive games, i.e. a losing streak for the first time since getting swept by the Los Angeles Dodgers in three games at Nationals Park, April 23rd through the 25th. That does speak to what the Nats have been doing. So if you're frustrated with what happened over the final two games of this series, I get it. But uh, bigger picture, good things are happening. Uh, Unfortunately, good things were not happening for Victor Robles on Sunday. So it was last Tuesday afternoon, May 7th, that the Nats announced having reinstated Robles from the 10-day injured list. He had been on that since April 4th due to a left hamstring strain. He, upon being reinstated off the 10-day IL, actually did not play in a game until this past Friday night's 5-1 win at the Red Sox. But Robles in that game was good. Starting right fielder, number nine batter, two for four, RBI single, another single, and he had a stolen base. And he had an outfield assist. Uh, But Robles in the 4-2 loss at the Red Sox on Saturday, starting right fielder, number nine batter, 0 for 2, hit by pitch, two strikeouts, and he got picked off. Top of the eighth, he drew a leadoff hit by pitch, but he was picked off uh, due at least in part to stumbling in uh, trying to slide back to first base. He then ran towards second base, was tagged out. There was a lot of slipping on that uh, Fenway Park infield in this series. So you have a good game for Robles on Friday night, uh, a not-so-great game on Saturday, although I wasn't too hard on Robles on the podcast regarding him getting picked off. It was a bad moment, but he slipped. I didn't want to put that as another Victor Robles base-running blunder. I thought maybe there were some circumstances there that were unfortunate. Well, uh, what happened on Sunday afternoon was plain bad Victor Robles. Uh, He was back to playing center field. He was, again, the Nats' number nine batter. He went 0 for 3 with a really bad fielding error, and he made a massive base running blunder. Uh, Robles, in a three run second for the Red Sox, committed a terrible fielding error. He dropped a routine fly ball. And I can't emphasize the word routine enough. This is as routine as fly balls can be. Uh, routine fly ball off the bat of Vaughn Grissom on a 1 2 pitch by Mackenzie Gore resulting in the bases being loaded with no outs. And then Robles in the next half inning. So literally minutes later, top of the third, 
gets on base via a one-out error, but then off a one-out first pitch single by C.J. Abrams into right field, gets tagged out in a rundown between second base and third base off going to third base despite Riley Adams being held at third base. Robles didn't realize that Adams was still at third. Uh, Inexcusable base running mistake by Robles, who, of course, has a bit of a history of uh, inexcusable blunders. And what I thought was so interesting, Tim, Nats manager Davey Martinez during his postgame session with reporters admitted that he wanted to pull Robles from the game, but Davey did not pull Robles from the game. This due to the Nats starting left fielder for the game, Jesse Winker, having to leave the game due to back spasm. So Davey was set to really send a message to Robles, ended up not being able to send that message uh, due to Winker dealing with the back spasms. Uh, But man, what a day for Victor Robles. You want Victor Robles off the IL? You got Victor Robles off the IL. Uh, You know, he, he comes back and then he commits these two ridiculous, I'll call them both mental, mental errors. And he does it at a time where there is a real ready-made replacement for him. I mean, Jacob Young, obviously, the stock is is up here. And it's just sort of reaching the point where for years I was happy to make excuses for Robles because I saw what there was in 2019 and I thought it could turn around. And then it, that got harder and harder. But, man, we just had the fifth-year anniversary of 2019, right? I mean, that that that's so far away. And I'm getting so sick of this stuff. And I imagine that David Martinez feels the exact same way. He has to. And we are so beyond the point of saying, well, Victor Robles needs to grow out of these mistakes. Like, no, (laughs) this is who he is. Okay. Victor Robles made his major league debut. I hope people understand this in 2017. Okay. 2017. It's now 2024. Numerically speaking, he is young. That is true. But from a standpoint of playing at the major league level, he has a ton of experience at this point. And if these boneheaded moments aren't out of his system yet, then they're probably never going to be out of his system. And it'd be one thing if he was still a really good player as he was in 2019, because then I think you could put up with these boneheaded moments. But he hasn't been that player since, like you said, 2019, which is a half decade ago at this point. And You know, I think everyone likes Victor Robles personally. I've never heard of anything of him being like a bad clubhouse guy or anything like that. It was interesting. Robles, after the game on Sunday, told reporters that Mackenzie Gore and other teammates showed support for Robles, came up to him and said that they had his back, that they supported him. I thought that that was cool. I think that that speaks to the person that Victor Robles is. But as Davey said during his postgame session with reporters, you can't have what Robles did in this game there will be errors that are made there will be outs on base pass that are made these two mistakes are like mortal sins in baseball the most routine of fly balls not being caught and then running to third base because you're not looking up and not noticing while you're running behind the catcher by the way so you should you should be mindful of this right that the guy, the catcher, is on third base, the bag to which you were running. It, it is completely unacceptable. I wonder the next time he gets a start in the lineup, uh, you know, w- injuries come into play and all things like that. But the fact that Davey Martinez says that, and as I said, obviously Jacob Young on the roster, um, and there might be a certain outfielder getting called up soon who was briefly Robles' teammate in Rochester – I don't know where this is going here for, for Robles in the next few weeks and months and uh, what his roster situation is going to be because, as I said, you just laid it out there so clearly. I mean, just imagine how frustrating it is for the franchise at this point. It has to be. I mean, I think on a good team, Victor Robles as a fourth outfielder, you could do a lot worse than that. Uh, but Victor Robles as an every game player, as a regular starter for you, I don't know how you can make that case anymore. You know, this yearning, this pining for 2019 Victor Robles, that guy's gone, okay? That guy's not coming back at this point. I think people need to stop, you know, searching for that or hoping for that. He can still be a contributor. You know, he can still be a guy who can maybe play well for you over stretches, but it's hard to 
see what we've seen since 2019 and still say, yeah, 2019 Robles is just around the corner. Uh, I, I don't know how you can say that. Now, in fairness to Robles, his base running blunder on Sunday was not the only base running blunder by the Nats in this game. Uh, C.J. Abrams, starting shortstop, number one batter, two for four with two first pitch singles. Abrams in the top of the first had a leadoff first pitch single to right center field, but he on the very next pitch was thrown out in an attempted steal of second base. He initially was called safe, but Red Sox manager Alex Cora successfully challenged the safe ruling. Uh, also on Sunday afternoon was Nick Senzel getting picked off. Uh, now, Senzel had a pretty good game. He has an at starting DH and number five batter, went one for two with a single and two walks. But Senzel in the top of the seventh of drawing a leadoff walk was picked off at first base for the first out. Uh, he appeared to slip on the infield dirt. So that was not good. Uh, but again, the uh, uh, dirt did not do Senzel any favors. But we also have this. So Senzel, top of the ninth, a one-out single into left center field on a one-two pitch, then was pinch run for by Jacob Young. And as Tim mentioned a few moments ago, uh, Young thrown out in an attempted steal of second base to end the game. So you had the Robles base running blunder. You had Abrams getting thrown out on an attempted steal. You had Senzel getting picked off. You had Young getting thrown out on an attempted steal to end the game. Four big outs by the Nats on the base paths. It seems way too common that we have games like this. This might be the most that they've made all year, or maybe every single time that I fill in and co-host that, that we're talking about this. Um, the Senzel one was ridiculous. This, you know, that one, he was, it seemed like he was totally asleep right there. And they're such rally killers. And uh, the young one, though, everyone in the ballpark knew he was stealing. He had a great jump. Uh, it was a great throw and a great, great throw and tag. I was surprised at how easily he was out, actually. I mean, Young immediately called for a review, but there was, if you saw it live, he was, he was definitely out. And you got to review at this point because it's the 27th out of the game. But the one that really sucks in my crawl, in addition to the roadway stuff that we covered uh, earlier, was the Senzel one. Just completely, you know, it, it took all the momentum out of the inning. The Nats are aggressive on a base pass, as we know. When you are aggressive, you are going to run into some outs. We get that. But I think it's important to keep in mind with what we're talking about from Sunday afternoon. The Victor Robles out is not an out of aggression or anything like that. Nick Senzel getting kicked off is not an out of aggression or anything like that. Those are things that should not happen. Now, C.J. Abrams getting thrown out on an attempted steal. Jacob Young getting thrown out on an attempted steal. Okay, the Nats are really pushing the envelope with the running game. You're not going to be successful 100% of the time. But things like the Robles boo-boo, things like Senzel getting picked off uh, should not be happening. Unfortunately, uh, those things did happen. Uh, now, a major bright spot for the Nats offensively on Sunday afternoon, Eddie Rosari. Uh, this really is something, what he's doing. Another home run for this guy. Another good game for this guy. Uh, Rosario on Sunday afternoon as an ad starting right fielder and number six batter. One for two with a two-run homer and two walks. And he had a stolen base. Rosario in an ad's two-run fourth. A two-out first pitch. Two-run homer to right center field to cut the Nats deficit to 3-2. Yet another home run for a guy in Eddie Rosario who like could not buy a hit for the longest time. And we, on this homer, had quite the visual. Red Sox center fielder Sedan Rafaela uh, actually caught the ball, but he went tumbling over the wall, Tory Hunter style, and into the Red Sox's bullpen. That was a home run. Uh, but, man, that is something that you can get at Fenway Park, an outfielder catching a home run and flipping over the outfield wall. Uh, and Rosario ends up uh, capping quite the series for him. He on Saturday, uh, one for two solo homer and a walk. Friday night, two for four, double a single and a stolen base. Eddie Rosario, for this regular season through games on May 2nd, had an OPS of 290. His OPS was 290. That is so bad. <laughs> Rosario now, last seven games, 10 for 22, four home runs, a double, five singles, and six walks. We've been singing the praises of James Wood at AAA Rochester. The recent numbers for Wood at Rochester, that's what Rosario's doing at the major league level here recently. This is some tear. Absolutely some tear. It's, what a stark turnaround. Uh, I love the Mr. May that you called me the other day. I know opposite reasons of Dave Winfield. 
I was reminded by this because I just sort sort of forgotten. I saw this on Twitter today. You know, April was his spring training because he was signed so late. Uh, totally forgot that. How much of that was was the reason? Who knows? He's still inexcusable to be hitting 053 for the first month of the season. But he's been at times the only source of offense for the Nats. Um, if the Nats are going to exceed expectations and be in playoff contention throughout the year, it's going to need to be guys like Eddie Rosario and Jesse Winker doing things like this, uh, giving them production in ways that they didn't anticipate. And also uh, the home, the home run you mentioned uh, right there with that shallow fence reminded me uh, if you could picture Shane Victorino hit a grand slam in the 2013 ALCS against Detroit. There's a famous photo of the Detroit center fielder with the legs up and the cop in the background and the, in the bullpen uh, Fenway has that sort of odd uh, aesthetic right there with the shallow fence. Also, wasn't it when Dalen Lyle got hurt in spring training this year for falling over the fence for the Nationals? I believe that was against the Red Sox, oddly enough. So kind of two times where we've had sort of that sort of instance there. Uh, but um, to your point about Rosario, I guess he needs to be in the lineup every single day at this point until this stretch cools off. Yeah, I mean, he has supplanted Jesse Winker as the low-cost veteran acquisition who's really surging. I mean, Winker has cooled off. He did not have a good series. Uh, Overall, has done some good things this season, but his numbers for the season have come tumbling down, and Rosario has gotten going here. I mean, one of the things that I lamented with Mark a few episodes back was, okay, you had Abrams and Winker going really well. You had Riley Adams going really well for a while. Those guys have cooled off. Where's that next wave of Nationals batters getting hot? And we were, for a while, not really having anyone who was supremely hot. Luis Garcia Jr. was going pretty well, but even he's kind of calmed down. Well, now here you have finally someone who really has gotten going uh, in Eddie Rosario. So really good to see that. And props to Davey Martinez. He stuck with Eddie Rosario through the struggles. Uh, I think a lot of us spelled. I know I did. Okay, He's not a great hitter. He's better than what we're seeing. I mean, to have a 290 OPS, you look at the guy's track record, you're like, okay, he's better than that. And uh, sure enough, (laughs) he has been a lot better than that lately. Uh, Another bright spot for the Nats in this 3-2 loss at the Red Sox on Sunday afternoon, Mackenzie Gore. Uh, He bounced back from his bad outing the previous Sunday afternoon, that uh, 11-8 Nats win over the Toronto Blue Jays at Nationals Park. On May 5th, Gore in that game, six runs, two earned in three innings. But Gore in this loss at the Red Sox on Sunday afternoon, three runs, two earned in six innings, nine strikeouts. He gave up six hits, which were two doubles and four singles. He issued two walks and two wild pitches. He threw a lot of pitches, but also a good number of strikes, 111 pitches, 71 strikes versus 40 balls. Uh, All of the runs off Gore in this game came in the bottom of the second, during which he allowed three runs, although only two of them were earned, uh, thanks to that error by Victor Robles. But also in this inning was a bizarro situation in which Gore had to get four strikes for a strikeout. Uh, Gore, in the bottom of the second, generated a one-out strikeout of the Red Sox's number one batter, Romy Gonzalez, for the second out in a plate appearance, during which the home plate umpire, Brian Onora, had the count wrong. So Gore actually got the strikeout via getting four strikes. That bottom of the second ended up being such an odd inning because you had the Victor Robles error. You had this whacked out situation in which uh, Gore had to get four strikes to get this strikeout of Romy Gonzalez. Uh, You had a run scoring wild pitch by Gore in the inning. Uh, There was a lot to take in that inning. I'm a defender of human umpires and I I like them, but this was not a great day for keeping human umpires over uh, the automated system. Completely inexcusable in 2024 for this to happen, but whatever it did. Uh, Yeah. That second inning, it's such a shame that that's where, you know, that's how the Nats lost that all the Red Sox runs came in that inning and the Nats couldn't, couldn't overcome it and get at least three or four runs because just a bunch of cheap ways that the Red Sox score, and it was early on, and the Nats just could never get over the hump and overcome it. I do love that Mackenzie Gore obviously pitched well today and that he had a career-high amount in pitches, but it still is frustrating at how quickly it seems he gets to 100 pitches almost every single outing. It's pretty much by the fifth inning, and that is one thing where 
as he continues to develop throughout his career, where it would be great if he could have a more economical pitch count because his pitch counts get so high, so quick. I would say every time. He's not pitch efficient. <laughs> you really can't argue otherwise. But he is proving effective. And I'll deal with some pitch inefficiency if you're going to put up some of the numbers that Gore is putting up. I mean, Gore now for this regular season, eight starts, ERA of 338, a strikeouts per nine innings of 11.48. Uh, that's really good. Now, the whip is high, 1.45. So that does speak to the pitch inefficiency. He's putting guys on base. And when you are a pitcher who generates strikeouts, you are going to have high pitch counts, right? Because you're not going to generate a strikeout over one or two pitches, right? At least three pitches. So uh, that is a reality with Gore. Uh, But yeah, I think overall he's doing a good job. Um, And, you know, I look at what happened in this game, you know, you're coming off what was not an impressive outing the previous Sunday afternoon. I know the defense failed Gore to an extent in that game, but he gave up a grand slam in that game and he bounced back in this game. There is this high variance with Mackenzie Gore. I've talked about that, where he can be really good. He also can be really bad. So you do want to see more consistency. But the overall body of work this season uh, is good. And I was looking at this after the game. If you look at the Nats from a starting pitching ERA standpoint, the Nats for the 2023 regular season had a starting pitching ERA of 5.02. That is horrendous. The Nats for this regular season now, a starting pitching ERA of 4.01. That isn't spectacular, but that's a lot better than 5.02, and the 4.01 is inflated uh, primarily by one man, Patrick Corbin, and even he has been better lately. But you look at Gore and Irvin and Parker and Trevor Williams, four guys who are pitching to the tunes of sub-4 ERAs. The Nat starting pitching has been a real strength. Certainly was in this series. Corbin in game one, Jake Irvin in game two, Mackenzie Gore in game three. The Nats in each of the three games in this series got at least a decent outing from the starting pitcher. They're getting a decent outing pretty much every single game. And on April 9th, when Josiah Gray went to the IL, and obviously he still has not returned, I would not have guessed that that's a sentence that we'd be saying on Mother's Day. Uh, So... I think it's really important to remember that, that all of this good slash solid slash decent slash acceptable starting pitching has come without Josiah Gray. Yeah. And you think about what the rotation might be when Gray comes back. You think about what the rotation might be when Cade Cavalli joins the rotation, whenever that is, presumably uh, June or July. And this could actually end up being a really good season of national starting pitching, uh, which would be awesome. And it's the kind of thing, as we know, if you get good starting pitching, you are in most games. I mean, you know, early in the show, we remarked how the Nats are like in every game, win or lose. Part of that is the starting pitching. When you get good starting pitching, you are going to be in games. It's like in hockey. If you have a great goaltender or you are getting great goaltending, you are in every game. If you're only giving up one or two goals a game, like you're in every game. Football, same thing. You have good defense. You keep the opposition to say less than 20 points a game. You're in every game. And I think we're seeing that with the Nats in these games. They are in games uh, in no small part due to the starting pitching. And the bullpen has played a role in this too. Uh, The bullpen on Sunday afternoon, was good once again. Two Nats relievers combined for two scoreless innings. Derek Law, a perfect bottom of the seventh with two swinging strikeouts. And Dylan Floro tossed a scoreless bottom of the eighth. You look at Nats relievers over the three games in this series. Two runs in seven innings. And both of those uh, runs came uh, off one reliever in one inning. Robert Garcia in the bottom of the eighth on Saturday. Uh, allowing two runs so overall pitching has been good and I think a lot of us didn't quite know what to expect from the Nats pitching coming into this season so far what you're getting is good far more good than bad far more good sometimes great bullpen pitching uh one nice thing of course with Gore going deeper today only two bullpen arms were used there's no off day as they move to Chicago And, you know, I am getting sick of seeing these days with five relievers. It seems like it's way more common than one would prefer. And you talk about the rotation, and then you start talking about the bullpen. And I know he didn't start today, Al, but you threw out a lot of starters that might be be on the rotation this summer. 
uh, with Gray and Cavalli. And that could mean that the bullpen could get a nice veteran left-hander uh, later in the season, if you know what I'm saying. If you know, you know. Could be. It could be. Although if he does well and he continues to do well, who knows? Maybe our friend Corbin uh, maintains his spot in the rotation. Who knows? Uh, we'll see. But, yeah, I mean, the Nats, you know, the, the saying in baseball of you can never have too much pitching, the Nats may have themselves a circumstance in, say, a month or two in which they have to make a hard call a tough decision regarding who stays in the rotation when's the last time uh that you could even entertain uh, a thought like that never so in that up- history uh no absolutely <laughs> not. uh next up for the Nats is a three-game series at the chicago white Sox. Uh, game one monday night at 7 40 trevor williams will be the dad starting pitcher game two tuesday night at 7 40 mitchell parker will be the dad starting pitcher and he will oppose Former Nats starting pitcher Eric Betty, our guy, Efed, taking on Mitchell Parker Tuesday night uh, in game two of the uh, Nats White Sox series. And then game three, Wednesday afternoon at 210. Patrick Corbin will be the Nats starting pitcher. Uh, the Nats do have an off day this week. Uh, they are off on uh, Thursday, May 16th. And then uh, after this series at the White Sox, do have a three game series at the Philadelphia Phillies. So the Nats are in the midst of a stretch of nine consecutive road games, three games at the Red Sox, three games at the White Sox, and then three games uh, at the Phillies. As Tim, finally, with this upcoming series at the White Sox, we will conclude this seemingly endless stretch of the Nats facing American League teams. There actually is a series coming up against a National League team uh, this weekend. Th- uh, this weekend, three games at the Phillies. Although after that, you have two more series against American League teams, a three-game home set against the Minnesota Twins, followed by three home games against the Seattle Mariners. But no, the Nats have not been relocated to the American League. They are still a uh, National League team. Yeah, the Nats sort of have like a college basketball schedule this year where November and December you play out of conference, and that's sort of what it's like. We're in December right now in college basketball terms, and they're playing all American League teams. Uh, I overall still like the scheduling format, uh, but it does seem like it's a little too much American League at once. I would like to get back to some divisional play that will happen. It is weird that uh, the Nats haven't played the Braves yet, for for example. But um, I'm re- you mentioned the Fetty matchup on Tuesday. I'm really happy that the Nats are going to face Fetty. That's going to be fun for Nats fans. Uh, he's <laughs> – excuse me. <laughs> That's going to be fun for Nats fans. He's – because he's, you know, he's part of the 2019 lore. And uh, so he's he's an unforgettable name if you're a diehard Nats fan. We've had our jokes about him competing with Voth, uh, you know, for the fifth spot. But uh, I, I am glad that th- that overlaps. And we'll see how he does against the former squad. This installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by Roaming Rooster. Uh, Roaming Rooster is at Nationals Park, proudly stationed in Section 386 in left center field, adding flavor to every game day experience. That's Roaming Rooster in Section 386 at Nationals Park. Hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the podcast, Nats Chat Podcast at gmail.com, including if you would like to sponsor the show, I would love to have you on board, see what we can do for you. Contact Tim at natschatpodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube. Just search natschat. Our YouTube handle is at natschatpodcast. We have a website that we invite you to check out, natschatpodcast.com, at which you can purchase a natschat podcast t-shirt. Uh, all Nationals radio highlights on that chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. For Tim Shovers, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast.